I saw Steve this morning when he asked me, well, earlier he asked me if I'd take the pleasure in introducing uh, Mr. Jimmy Emmons this morning, and I said, absolutely, I would, um, and I'll tell you why. But before I do, and I walked in this morning, Steve said, have you got enough information on Jimmy? And I said, I got more dirt on Jimmy Emmons than you can ever imagine, and I've seen him covered in more dirt than you can ever imagine. But I always also have to remind myself that that is good soil that's on Jimmy's skin. Um, when I think about Jimmy Emmons and I think about my opportunity to introduce him this morning, I think I have an opportunity to introduce one of the most genuine guys I've ever had a chance to meet and work with in my time in Oklahoma. He's got a bio that's in everybody's uh, manual, so I'm not going to really jump into a lot of information there. Uh, but he does have a large operation outside of Leedy, Oklahoma. And we all know that his wife, Ginger, runs the operation, so he can move around and hobnob with folks like yourselves. Um, but I saw Jimmy two years ago give a talk um, in Selena when we were there, and I never seen such a packed room. And I think it was one of the first presentations that he'd really given to such a large group, and he was a little bit nervous, but I'm telling you what, he hit it out of the park. His message resonates with everybody. I don't care who you are, if you're a conventional farmer, organic farmer, just moving into no-till, whatever. Jimmy doesn't discern what type of farming operation you have. He likes all of you. He treats everybody the same. He's there to help and to guide and learn, help you learn from the mistakes that he's made in the past. There's one ex ex um, excerpt coming out of his bio that I do want to read because it's something that I'm particularly um, proud of Jimmy and Ginger for this new award that they're going to receive here shortly. Jimmy and Ginger are the inaugural Leopold Conservation Award winners for Oklahoma. The Sand County Foundation gives this award in recognition of agricultural landowners actively committed to a land ethic. This certainly describes the Emmons efforts. And also, when Jimmy, when we think about the amount of time that it takes to do what he's doing, he always gives himself unselfishly to everybody in every organization. So on top of being a very successful producer, Jimmy's also the current president of the Oklahoma Association of Conservation Districts, the vice president of the Dewey County Conservation District, secretary of the Oklahoma Wheat Growers Association, a member of the No-Till on the Plains board, and he also is a cooperator and an extreme help to the Noble Research Institute. I'm proud to call Jimmy a friend of mine. I've learned a lot from him, and I'd like for you all to give, me a, to give him a great round of applause. So I welcome him to the stage. Well, good day. I wanted to start on a high note. Thank you. You know, that song says a lot in the first few seconds. Marty Stewart does a great job at articulating how important the soil is in a song. By reaching down in the desert, picking up the sand, letting it flow through his hand, and listening to what the wind says. Wow. I just think that's very neat. I think that's a wonderful message that we have to look at today and for the future. Today we're going to talk about rejuvenating our souls and how it's really regenerated our life. And, and that's a little backwards there. We're, we've been working on regenerating our souls but it's really changed Ginger and Carson and I's life. Because we look at things differently than we've ever looked before. And where is Ginger at and Carson? They're here. Y'all stand up. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> now, the cows at home today are on the Darwin theory, and they've been on the Darwin theory for a day or two. Uh, they have to make it till some of us gets back home. So um, I'm going to start and, and tell you a story of Emmons Farms. But I really like what Will Rogers said. Last year we said things can't go on like this, and they didn't. They got worse. Has anybody noticed that lately? Yeah, and that was a long time ago, but Will Rogers was uh, a person that had very uh, insightful uh, to the future, and it applies today more than ever. Soil. Every one of us in this room, 
every one of us in this world has soul in common. We have never looked at our soul the way we should from the beginning to present. We're now on the forefront and the very cutting edge of realizing that soul is the future. It's been the past, but it's the future. Everything we do has a consequence on our soul. Everything. We really have to look at that. The reason I put this up from Stephen McCraney is the master has failed more time than the beginner has ever tried. Remember that. I'm no master of what I do. I'm a master of a lot of failures. But every time I fail, you know what? If you're walking forward and you fall, which way do you fall? Forward. We got to march on forward to get this done. And, and how critical that is. So I took this slide uh, just a few months ago. This was a wheat field uh, 50 miles from my place. And Ginger and I was driving down the road to go to a meeting. Uh, we saw this and we had to pull over and Ginger took this shot. This is today, folks, a very highly productive farm near Thomas, Oklahoma. We can't afford to do this. We've been doing this now since the 30s. We're a lot better than we were. I want to point that out. But driving up here, I could have took several, several more shots of similar things, maybe not quite as dramatic as this, but we have to change that. So this is the way it used to look at Emmons Farms. We were very clean, and I, I jokingly said this, but I, I really, I should have said this when I come out. Uh, my name's Jimmy Emmons. Uh, I'm a recovering tillage addict. So I want you to know whatever I share today that I am a recovering tillage addict. I grew up on that. And that's part of the message today. This was actually my picture that I took of a neighbor we're planting wheat for this gentleman in a custom situation. Uh, this is not what I like to do and I'd like to convert him but I have not won that battle yet. But since them days, we have reduced our fuel costs by two-thirds. I look back seven years ago, and we're a little over $120,000 in fuel cost. Uh, this year, on the same amount of acres, we're at 15000 As we look at ag today, and we look at financial statements, and, and, and mine's not the greatest nowadays, just like you guys. I can't imagine having 100,000 more dollars in debt just for fuel. How that's really helped us. But it's also not about just money. It's about lifestyle and how you live. My dad in the 50s, they farmed 1,000 acres of land with two A John Deere's. He told the story. They run 24 seven. He had a brother then. Uh, he had a hired hand. His brother had a hired hand. They run 24-7 on a thousand acres. And dad always done the night shift because he could stay awake. And um, so what did we do? We just bought bigger tractors. I'll never forget in 1965, I was just a young lad then, my dad bought a 3020 diesel John Deere. Well, what a power horse. I still have the A, that's what I cut my teeth on, planted my first wheat crop with it. We still use the 3020 today, but it's a utility tractor instead of the plow horse. But when Ginger and I got married, we were farming enough with Dad and what we were doing that we were putting a thousand hours a piece on two tractors. You figure that out at 10 hours a day, that's, that's, that's 100 days through the summer. I missed a lot of my son's activities in high school because we were, we were farming, we were baling hay, we done custom operations, we took whatever it took to, to make it go. And remember what Alan said yesterday, we were focused up here on the dollars here, chasing them, trying to make it work, instead of looking at it in reverse. So that's how 
our life has changed. Now, we, we, we spend a lot of time moving cattle around and different things, but we don't sit on a tractor for thousands and thousands of hours. You know, good people can make bad or harmful decisions if the systems within there are making those decisions are poorly designed. You can literally jump out of one fire into another if you don't really look at what's going on. So be careful with that. So what we done seven years ago is we started looking at our objectives. You know, think about what you're doing and why you're doing it. We evaluated different farming methods and evaluated how our management decisions affected the soil resource. So now it becomes the primary concern is the soil. So how did we do that? We got a list of methods out. We looked at nature. You have to look at nature of what was here before we came along and destroyed the resource and plowed the prairie up. There's lots of history books you can look at to see what was in your area. I encourage you to do that. Now we were tilling, but we still wanted to look at tilled. We wanted to look at no-till, which we were doing, have been doing for several years on some of the property, but not near all of it. Then we started looking at no-till with cover crops. Would it work in Leedy, Oklahoma? That was a big concern in the early days. And now we're looking at no-till with cover crops and livestock. And I'm telling you, once we got to that point, things started really changing. But how did we go about this? First of all, we looked at nature. Nature's methods. So nature has no mechanical disturbances, armor on the soil, cycles water very good, diverse living plant roots, lots of animal activity, more than we, we would ever put on our land. Thousands of years of research and development, very dynamic and complex. You know, it was created to be self-sustaining, regenerating itself, and very functioning. Can we farm in the image of this? Can we replicate that? Sure we can, sure we can. So we looked at tillage. Tillage increases the availability of food biology and increase, increasing respiration, but we're depleting soil organic matter very rapidly. We've depleted half of that over our country. We're putting CO2 in the atmosphere. We're increasing fuel. Remember what I said about fuel, time, and labor? It's very intensive. And we're primarily dependent on inputs, synthetic fertilizer, chemicals, because once the biology stops, we've got to replace that with something. So we don't want to do that. Low plant diversity, biological diversity is, is, is very, very low. You know, is there really any difference here in the moon and my neighbor's field? Yeah, it's all absent of life. You know, other than where we can walk on it. And lo and behold, we've walked on the moon and we still walk here. So in the till situation, and I love this slide, I don't know why anybody would do that to their soil. If you look at the, at the soil really here. But I can't find any pros to this picture. And, and there's a lot of it across the country this way. But I find lots of cons. You know, less carbon for the microbes to feed on. You know, the, we, we took the color out of the soil because the carbon is gone. We destroy structure, we destroy biological life. You can go on and on and on down through that list of things that we've really done to our soil. So now we're gonna look at a no-till method. What are we doing better here? We're planting a crop. We also got another crop later, but we have a big fallow period in the middle. Now, no-till is better than the till ground, but there's still that big fallow period in the middle that we don't have a living root in the ground. And what happens? It starts to degrade. If we're not moving forward, we're degrading. And then I can show you that in further down. But we're doing better there than in the till method. 
This would be that scenario where you'd plant a cash crop, you'd maintain a cash crop, you'd harvest it, and then you'd leave it fallow. And we'd use chemicals and other things in that fallow period to control weeds because if you don't have it covered, what's gonna happen? We're gonna have weed pressure. The flow of carbon's interrupted in that during the fallow period, so the resource starts to degrade. It starts collapsing. We can see layers coming in the soil as that starts to collapse upon itself. So it's an incomplete system. So the no-till method, you know, the pros, we're gonna save some time, we're gonna save money, we're gonna, we're gonna save some money on fuel and decrease, then we are gonna decrease erosion, either in wind or water. That's gonna help. We're, we're moving ahead, but we're still not where we need to be. The cons, we're gonna to have to have more chemicals to control that. We're gonna have fallow periods that interrupts the flow of carbon. We're gonna have no diversity or very little. We're dependent on more inputs. We're also gonna cause compaction because the system is collapsing on itself as the micros feed. Now we're gonna look at cover crops. And we thought then, well, I don't know if we can do that in Lady Oklahoma. We know it works up north, it works back east, but can we do this in Oklahoma? Here's kind of what some of the things that we looked at. We're doing a better job. We're still feeding the soil. We're also trying to capture some of that CO2 and build soil organic matter. We got high diversity now and high, high biological activity and we're capturing CO2. We're moving forward. It's getting better now. So we're gonna plant a, a cash crop, maintain it, harvest that crop, we're gonna plant a cover crop the same day or the, very shortly after we harvest that, and then we're gonna terminate that cash crop, and look what happens. Continuous flow of carbon now. We've got a complete circle. We're feeding the biology as we go through the system, and how important that is, I cannot stress that enough. So as we look at cover crops, look at the pro side now. Our soil is gonna get more mellow because we're feeding the biology. It's coming in, we're living root 24 seven if we can, if mother nature allows that. High biological population. Our soil aggregates are growing so we can infiltrate more. We, and, and as that goes up, our nutrients start cycling. Everything starts kicking in. We're saving on inputs and cost. I just, man, it's, and we're starting to mimic nature now. We're getting closer, we're starting. You know, it's gonna be complex though. You're gonna to have to think harder. The easy button is no longer available. Managing biomass, what does that mean? It means in the early days, you're gonna be over concerned about you've got too much, what are we gonna do with it? Down the road, how am I gonna get more? How am I gonna feed all these animals below ground? It's a little bit managing. But you know what, it's gonna require quite a bit of faith and patience, and Jimmy's had to learn patience. Jimmy was not always patient in the beginning. But you're gonna to have to have the commitment to stay the course. Nowhere in life do we start down a road that we get there if we get off course. So you're gonna to have to stay focused as you move forward. So what happens when we put livestock or animals in the system. All at once, we're gonna start feeding the biology a lot quicker because we have a soil health, what? Accelerator. We're gonna speed things up now. Now if we're gonna get there, and I like to get there, and I've got a heavy foot when I drive, animals will help you get there quicker. So the system now is kicked in high gear and really starts to move. And so now when we plant a crop, we maintain that cash crop, we harvest it, we plant no-till cover crop in there. Now we're gonna put animals out there and graze that and start capturing revenue coming back. But we're also capturing revenue, but we're feeding the soil. We allow that now to regrow after we graze that before we terminate it. So what does that do? Now our overall soil health is going off the chart. Things are really starting to kick in and now we have a complete functioning system. The pros, 
we're still keeping that living root that feeds the biology. Our soil becomes more resilient. What does that mean? We've been 118 days at Leedy, Oklahoma without a drop of rain. One tenth, according to the mesonet. But I have 13 inches in my profile yet. It's just down there about four to six inches. It's there, it's waiting for the next move that we have. It's still gonna be complex and you're gonna need some fencing and you're gonna need some water if you have animals in it. A lot of us across the country have done away with that infrastructure, but we're gonna to have to put that back in. We're still gonna to have to manage some biomass, but we're still gonna to have to be patient because the first year is gonna be crappy in the Jimmy Emmons three year rule. First of all, we see this time and time again that cover crop's not going to be what you expect the first year because you've got an addictive soil, just like Jimmy Emmons was addicted to tillage. The second year is going to be a little better, but this thing between my hat, below my hat, and between my ears is still not engaged yet to really understand the soil. If you can get to three and, and four years then you're gonna start seeing magnificent things coming because you're learning what to look for as you go. Just remember where the animals go, what happens, the nutrients flow. And that's what we want. We want that, and 80% of that is going back to the soil. But while they're doing that, we're putting money in our pocket. We're growing beef, we're growing lamb, we're growing chickens, lots of different animals that you can use. So which method would you choose if you analyzed your farm just the way I've described? Which is gonna rejuvenate your soil and make your lifestyle better? Okay, we wanna look at that. This is what we just laid out for you here. So we want a fungal dominant, we want diversity, we want biomass, we want complexity. We don't want simple. We've done simple for years. This, this soil was not simple in the beginning. Remember that. We have, we have created simple in monocultures, but we want benefits. Here's the two that's gonna give them. The livestock's gonna give us the most but at least if you can get to cover crops in no-till, you're well on your way. So making the same decision multiple times without change is no longer a decision, folks. It just becomes the choice, and my gosh, we've done a great job in that. When I grew up, we were wheat, 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 and we had a little dab of alfalfa and a little dab of cotton, but there was no rotation because the alfalfa growed on the bottom land, the cotton grew on the bottom land, and wheat was everything else. And Lord forbid that we would mix them and put that in a rotation. Very simple choice. The question really becomes, do you have a true desire to make your soil better? You know, I think my granddad and my dad had that desire. They just didn't have the education or the equipment that we do today. My granddad could have never planted in the biomass that I'm planting in today. Neither could my dad. They use the best resources they had, so why can't I use the best resources I've got? I think we miss that a lot. You know, where there's life, there's hope. And wow, look at that beautiful cover crop there. Isn't that pretty? So much prettier than the dust blowing. So, that's where we started, and here the journey begins, and this is Jimmy Emmons' first mistake. This is our very first cover crop. My soil scientist, Steve, is sitting out there, and he, I know he remembers this day. I could not remember, remember, year one, between these two ears is an idiot that's addicted to tillage, looked at this and said, I cannot plant in all that residue. So what did I do? I, I go out and I buy a brand new vertical tillage, $70,000, I till this up and I'm feeling pretty good about myself. I can raise these cover crops, I can do this. What an idiot I was. Look at all that soil. 
but at least I was smart enough to realize not to do it all, to learn. And I talk about this a lot about doing strips, trying to learn. And what did we learn that first year was very powerful. I left that strip and when we got the yield data back, guess what? There was no, and I mean no yield difference where we'd run the vertical till versus where the cover crops was. And all at once this big sledgehammer come out of the sky and it hit me and he said, good Lord, Jimmy Emmons, what have you done? You spent $80,000 on a piece of equipment that all it's doing is costing you money. You're burning more fuel, you're going back to the old way. You know what I done? I called my dealer up and I said, I've got this new vertical tillage, I've only used it this many acres. I got a 30 foot drill, I need a 40 foot drill, trade me. I got rid of it immediately. The best thing that I've ever done in my life. And it was a good tool if you like tillage. But you know what, if you're an alcoholic, what's the worst thing you can be around? If you're addicted to tillage, what's the worst thing you can be around? It's implements and tillage. I'm telling you, when you're an addict, you've got to get rid of it. Then, what did we do? We traded that for the best tool I've ever run across. We started looking. On the left is where we're vertical tilled. On the right is where the cover crop was. We dug a little bit later. On the left, on the right. Once Jimmy Emmons saw this, it's like, my God, Ray Charles can see that. Yeah, that's how I felt. It's like, oh my gosh. So we carry one of these in every pickup. And when we go to a field, I love to dig now. I love to look where we're at. When I see my wheat growing out there and I've got cattle on it, and then people tell me you can't graze in no-till because it's gonna get hard. Yeah, it will if you don't have covers in there. If you build that big sponge, it's like a shag, who remembers shag carpet? And, and a good pad under, what happens if you throw an extra pad under that? When you're walking on that, my gosh, it's comfortable. Just think what the animals think when they're walking on that. Then we started looking at water because at home, everybody said, Jim Emmons, you can't do that. We only get 20 inches of rain, sometimes less in 2011 and 12, we had nine. So we pulled cores with NRCS. They measured the, the profile at the end and my God, what happened? Look at all the extra water we had in the cover crop on the right. But how could that be? So we better look a little deeper. So year two, we pulled in the fall and in the spring, and what happened? We proved we do use water. If you look there, we used about three more inches of water with the cover crop and grazing it than we did in the check area. And, you, and then my neighbor said, yep, I told you that. You know, told you. You're gonna use that. But what happened when we pulled it in February? We had gained that all back when the Lord provided rain and snow at a higher rate. And my, once again, I said, wow. Wow, our infiltration is getting better. We know the system's working. And I, I, I told Steve this up front. I said, I think in the first year, this is what's happening. Now we proved it. We, we do use more water up front. But when, when it does rain, we're infiltrating it more and we're storing it. So in the end, we're water ahead. Wow. Then we started more diversity and things started really clicking. So we want to look deeper because what happened? Our university started saying, well, Jimmy, you're, you're cheating. You're not playing right. You've moved them around, you're testing in different areas. 
You're not doing reduction science. So Troy and I went, agreed for the next five years, if he doesn't retire, and Steve, if he retires, I, you, we gotta get somebody else to help me. We marked all 40 by 40 squares where we're never gonna have cover crops for five years, no matter what. And they're GPS points. Then around that is gonna be cover crops in between our cash crops or our grazing crops. What we're seeing already is amazing data. And, and, and in the future, I'll share this with you. I want to do all the research so we have a fair look at that when it's over. We are going to prove in the end, in a replicated situation with a third party, how we can manage water. This was this fall. We had a group of Australians came to see us. Why? They wanted to compare our temperature to theirs and what we have in common, and lo and behold, we're two worlds apart, but we have soil in common. And how do we take care of that soil, two worlds apart? The same way, the same way. If you get nine inches of rain or you get 60 inches of rain, the system works. The principles apply everywhere. Yesterday, Alan talked about change. I'll tell you about change. Everybody wants change. Nobody wants to change. We see that all over the world in the country today. I'll tell you how change is. Change is easy if you're comfortable with it. On the way up Sunday, and this never happens, Four miles from Leedy, remember I tell you I've got a heavy foot, I, I pulled out behind somebody that came by and they were driving the speed limit. 64 mile an hour to be exact. <sighs> we're never gonna get to Wichita, so the first chance I got I whipped out. Now, when I pulled out on the road, I seen somebody else coming back a half a mile, but I had plenty of time and I never looked back because I'm moving forward. So the first chance I got, I blowed around that blue pickup and I was stepping on that Dodge and all at once that blue pickup was not behind me, there was a black pickup. And then the lights came on. 80 mile an hour and a 65. So we had a little talk and it turns out he was a good guy and I explained to him I was going to soil caretaker and I had to give this big presentation and I need to get there early. <laughs> he felt a little sympathy for me and lo and behold he let me go. But I still had to drive 64 mile an hour because he was going to follow me. <laughs> but you know I got so lucky, Joe my neighbor was coming from the north at a high rate of speed. And he saved me. <laughs> so now what is Jimmy? He is very comfortable because the, the, the highway patrolman's going back then. I know he's gonna be busy a little while. So now Jimmy changed very easily. Change comes that way. We have to make it comfortable. You have to understand the system. So this is at Alan Mindeman's this summer. Greg Scott's in the soil pit. That is shale rock at the bottom, sandstone. We've got a good soil pit. Alan's done a great job over the years down there, very good friend and mentor of mine. I want to be just like Alan. After we left that afternoon, it rained. Now look at the berm around it. Alan didn't level that off because we don't want to disturb the, the sides of the pits. So we have a big berm around that. They got an inch and three tenths. And they sent me this picture. Does anybody see any ditches where the water run in from the top? No. You know why? Because Alan's system is working. The water cycle is working the way it's supposed to. It rained, it went in, and that good cover crop he has there, it infiltrated down through the earthworms and the, and the aggregates in the soil. And where did it come out? Because his profile is full. The least resistance was the pit. 
and it was screaming in there. That's the way it's supposed to work, folks. Water is not supposed to run on top of the soil, down the creek, down the ditch, to the pond with all the sediment and all the nutrients in it. On big flood events, we will see some of that if the profile is full. But it's not supposed to work that way when a normal rain or a rain event that we have. So I went to Tennessee, and yes, I am standing. This is Adam Doherty, uh, uh, State uh, District Conservation in Tennessee. He took me out. I was doing a field day with him. Exceptional beans. Exceptional beans. The best I've ever seen. And, and it's not just all plants there, folks. They're loaded from top to bottom. So I, I look down in the canopy. And you see a little sunlight. You know why? Because I spread that apart to take this picture. The biology is so active there, they're done eating a lot of the residue. But look at the residue he has there. So I gently tuck and pull that back. And look at that soil. Look at all the earthworm holes, all the infiltration points that's in this soil. And everybody says, well, yeah, Jimmy, that's in Tennessee. It's better soil than they get 60 inches of rainfall. Well, I agree with that. But I took my proscope out on my phone and I took this shot right there on the surface. So now you see up close when I talk about infiltration and, and, and how we can soak in, it looks like the Grand Canyon around them, them soil aggregates and how fast that can go in. I took my shovel and I dug some soil up. Look at all the root mass in there. Look how beautiful that soil is. Now in this field, there's a neighbor that joins it and there's no fence row like at home. They have a post on the west end and a big oak tree at the creek on the other end. And you, the only difference in that field was the beans in the next field I'm going to show you was about this tall. Very good beans. A very good no-till farmer, but no cover crops. This is what his soil looks like. See some weeds coming. You know that something's off because all the algae's on top of the ground. So over there in the top left corner, I focused in on that area. I took this picture. Now where's water gonna go if it comes now? What's happening is the biology is collapsing. The system is shutting down. Even though we still got a, a bean crop in there, we've had nothing to feed them in between. So when I took my proscope, I took this picture, that is not the moon, that is not the lunar module on the left. This is what that soil looks like on top, folks. The only difference is cover crops because they're two great producers. I met both of them, wonderful guys. So once again, everybody said, well, yeah, Jimmy, that happens in Tennessee. So I came home. Oh, this is a comparison of them two soils, I'm sorry. Look at the difference there. It's like, wow, look at the carbon difference. Look at the, the root mass going down through there. So I came home, the one on the left is my soil. This was with the proscope. I walked across the road on my neighbor that is a tillage attic. He tilled this soil six times this summer. He planted wheat. He grazes his wheat out. He's a take-all guy, a good guy. When it rains, a three or four inch rainfall event, guess where I, his, his water's going down the road. Now, I dug a soil pit when the Australians were there. You saw it. This next shot is me in the pit after a huge rain. Now, we had a big rain event, and I was just down there as I was looking around earthworms and seeing what, what it, the pit looked like. The other day, we had a huge rain. You can see very muddy down there. But really, what happened is, 
Look at all the earthworm activity. And what happened, all the water was running out of these earthworm holes into the pit. See the dark carbon soil? Look how dark that is. Come out. It's just amazing to look here at what we're seeing. I wished I'd been there when it was raining. But in here. How dark that soil is. Stream down. Where it's coming out of the earthworm holes. Here, but then as we scroll around, I broke this root off by accident. This is a soybean plant. Straight down. That root went way on down below that. That's about two and a half feet into the ground. And look, all the water was infiltrating down through this soil. But it rained. It did not run over in from the top. It came out all these earthworm holes. This is down about three foot, four foot. Here's some more examples. One of the most amazing things, I wish I could have been here when it was raining. All the water came out. And yet, we still had lots of mycorrhizal fungi. A grower here in this, really done well. Just amazing. You can see our darkening layer on the top. Yeah, they're right there. So that got us to thinking. All right, let's measure our infiltration. Let's see how good we're doing. So Jim Johnson, Noble Research, came out. Carson, I would have done point him out a while ago. We got a mini disc infiltrometer and we started measuring. We can move that tube and make it go faster. The wind was blowing that day, I apologize for that. It's amazing how this tool works. It's very effective, very easy. Every minute you measure how much is going in. So to check that out, you see there in the back, we have some rings. We're, we're recording the data. Carson there is timing it. Jim's writing it down. We put it on a spreadsheet and we measured our infiltration right there. But next, our first inch took two minutes and two seconds. We're on our second inch of water now, and we're right around 20 minutes. So that means we could easily take a two inch rain that occurred in a half an hour. And while those events are rare, they do occur. Uh, those extreme two inch per half an hour, four inch per hour rainfall events, three inch per hour rainfall events. This soil would take that all in uh, rather than letting it run off. And that would go to refilling the aquifer, refilling the profile, and not uh, <laughs> contaminating stream water with nutrients in, in loading downstream. Yeah, absolutely. It has a lot of effects for the downstream watershed uh, as well as for the, the next crop that's going to grow here. So we're uh, storing we're water in the ground for the next one. We, and we got soils that will take more than that, but that's pretty, that's pretty good. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna continue to grow cover crops, and I am standing in that triticale, in this rye, and I'm in wheat country. You don't think I go to the coffee shop, I don't catch a little heck. I'm not gonna go to the coffee shop because I want this. I wanna plant soybeans in this. Why? Because I don't want any weeds in my beans. 
And the cheapest way to get rid of a, be a weed is with a seed, not a chemical. Look on the left up there, you see all sorts of weeds coming in that bare ground. That's what we want. This is in the early years, and look at the earthworms. We've talked about them a lot, but look at that dark soil, and look at that poop that they're putting out, and how dark that is compared to my soil. Now, when we go over the country, Ginger and I made a trip last year, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But I went to Rick Bieber's farm in South Dakota, and look at a little difference in the soil. Soil's a Soil is good at Rick's. He's a good caretaker. And everybody says, well, in Oklahoma, the soil is red, and, and it, it's, it, we can't never replicate what Rick's done. But remember a while ago when they came this summer and Rick was with the Australians? Rick got a shovel out, and he dug at my place. Quite a bit of similarity there. But look at, the earthworms are still mixing that darker soil. We're building it in Oklahoma. We just haven't been at it as long as Rick has up there. This is my neighbor that I've got started, Roger Oman. He's planting wheat. I finally got Roger to understand that we can do that. We can do that very successful. So that was where the cover crop was behind Roger there. So now we're going to move over where we left a strip and there was no cover crop. Okay, now we'll try it in the no-till without cover crop. Once again, I apologize for the wind. What's the difference here, Jim? Several inches. So are you not going as deep or deeper? Going less deep over here. By how much? No cover crop. I'll probably go with four inches over here in the no cover crop. I'll probably go with eight inches in the cover crop. Sides. The amazing how fast that soil changes when you feed it and you have a good system in there. So we started learning that if we'd form partnerships, we could learn quicker. We could get more experts in. This is our NRCS guys that were out that day or from our state conservationist was even there looking down Gary O'Neill. We had soil scientists come out. We learned to start digging in the soil. We had more people come. We've had Jim and Alan. We've even had OSU out trying to encourage them as a university. They should be leading instead of dragging behind to learn what we're doing. We got our crop consultant, Darren Mills, there with us. We started measuring forage with a grazing land specialist, and we started figuring out Egyptian wheat has high lignin in it, it'll last longer in these sandy soils and we can continue to build. We also invited John Deere out. Joby there on the left is an engineer that's designing equipment 15 and 20 years in front of us, trying to figure out where we're gonna be in 15 years and where they need to be as a company and what we need. We also had Steve come out, and, and we've had PR people come out, and Robert Hathorne there were measuring in the cover crop there. We've had Willie and we've had Ray out to look in the soil, the soil health experts trying to help us and, and trying to learn from them. We started having soil health days, trying to figure out the system and share with neighbors and learn. We've had field days. We've done plant ID of cover crops, why we planted this species and what was its multiple purpose that we planted them, why, what was their purpose, why did we put that many in? So here we are in Jimmy Emmons Milo field. This has been cover cropped the past several days. 
or years, four years, cover crop, some high intensity grazing on that, some rotation crops. But what's really interesting to me is the mellowness of this topsoil. The fact that I can reach down and take my hand and, and, and grab handfuls of soil. We're sitting here on July 24th. It's dry, but this is mellow and this is no-till and been no-tilled for years. But the, the cover crops, the crop rotation, the high intensity grazing, I believe has really done a lot to mellow this soil surface. And you can see it as you walk on it and you can definitely feel it with your hands. And it's just amazing to me how mellow this is. And so Jimmy says that when the weather's nice, this is just full of earthworms. And, and I expect it would be. Nice and friable. Nice smell of soil. It's really come a long way. Rain sorghum showing that we still have water in the profile. We're at 11 o'clock in the morning here, uh, probably 85 degrees. Uh, still pretty fresh appearance for as dry as we are on top. So we know that we got water still in the profile that we're feeding off of, which we started with 14 inches in the profile. So Apparently no-till doesn't get hard, it gets mellow, if you do it right. If you do it right. Cover crops, grazing, crop rotation, use the soil health principles. You gotta have the system for system. this to work right. And this is what I, I agree with you, that this is working right. Good job. So when you take a probe out on that, that soil, after we started implementing cattle, this will go down you about stand yourself on your head there. That soil has really changed so quick, even though we were so dry. And you see in the background the pollinator strip there that we have for the beneficials. Dr. Lundgren will tell us there's 1,700 beneficials in the army sitting there waiting to combat the enemy when it comes in. We, gra we raised great grain sorghum there this year with only 40 units in no chemicals other than that. No weed control, no insecticides. We, we would have been in the high 80s if we hadn't had a 70 mile an hour wind to lay some of that down. Very profitable. Then we went and we done some companion cropping in sunflowers. Gotcha. So here we got is a, a companion sunflower mix. Um, basically in this mix we got mustards, flax, buckwheat, uh, German millet, um, we also have uh, some guar, mung beans, and cow peas in here for nitrogen fixation. But basically the goals with the companion milo, or companion sunflower mix is uh, to attract as many beneficial insects as possible. Um, we want to uh, be able to control uh, the headworms, um, other insects that may cause pest issues on uh, sunflowers in a monoculture but also what we really look at here is uh, weed suppression in between the sunflowers as you can see with the millets and the, the companions lower there's a lot more weed suppression going on um, versus over here in the monocultures where there's a lot of bare ground a lot a lot of potential for pig weeds to come in Basically, Jimmy will harvest these sunflowers this fall. Um, there's a strip in here, you said 40 foot wide? Yeah, it's 40 foot wide that we've had no companions. So there will be a, a strip in here with no companions to really compare the weed suppression this fall going into winter. Ground coverage, the, another big issue with sunflowers is typically sunflowers don't leave a lot of residue behind. 
Um, they'll leave a stock, but not much ground coverage, so the companions will also help out this fall um, with water and, water and wind erosion. Um, so this is something else that we'll be observing through this field. Well, it's been very interesting to see all the different companions and how you can see the flax is blooming here uh, and, the, and the buckwheat. So we have lots of activity buzzing around, especially with the flowers blooming now. But very interesting. We'll see how it progresses. Yeah. Thanks a lot. That turned out very well. That, that strip when we harvested, my, my custom harvester noticed that it was more moist where the companion was versus where we had none. He was thoroughly shocked. We did have a big wind event like that on the Milo. We, we laid a lot of them heads down into the canopy of the companions. Some people would think that's a loss, but remember I've got animals. So I turned the cows out after we harvested. I run them nearly 67, 68 days with no feed other than the companions and the heads that had blown down. Great feed for cows. They looked awesome. So it was a win. So very, very good system. Like I said, we've traveled around and, and, and tried to see experts in the field. Rick and Jay, we've been to Gabe's. We've been to Darren Williams. We've been to see Dr. Beck. We've been to Tennessee to see Adam and his people there. Buzz Clute, I love Buzz Clute. We was looking in the soil here in a, in a cover crop that we'd rolled down. It's just amazing. We also like to go to our friends and neighbors not very far away from us in a different area to see what they're doing and try to learn from them. But we've also been to DC. We, you know, we, we do have a new farm bill coming up and we want soil health in the new farm bill and we want more flexibility in the cover crops. And then I was also very blessed that West Texas A&M invited us out to teach a class about that. And when we got done there, the instructor told me, he said, I don't know how you managed to engage the kids. They've never been so excited. People, we got to get our youth involved in this. We've also been very, very fortunate to have lots of media. The BBC came. We had friends in Ireland saw the, the story that we've done on, on climate and how to, that we can build resilience in the soil. We've had Larry Butler out on the land We've had ABC come out and look at what we're doing in grazing. And it's not about me being on television, folks. It's about the message to the consumer, to the world, what we can do. We also learn to measure our, our crops that are growing, our grazing, and how we can manage our animals when we put them on. This is a test that we've done about grazing. I just wanted to take 25% of the cover crop with the animals. I wanted to trample down some and I wanted to leave a bunch to feed the system early. And look what when we measured, 22% is what we used. We was very close to our target. When you surround yourself with good people that know how to do this, you can achieve this very quickly and very easily. We, we rotated them cattle. This was the first year that we rotated cattle. So we were on 11 acres. We didn't have very high stock density then because we were very uncomfortable with trying to figure this system out. We moved them every three or four days. But look what we were able to do. In 39 days on that 60 acres, we took $115 worth of beef of our own cattle. This is not custom grazing. This was our own cattle. The calves on the cows gained nearly three pounds a day while we were resting our native range. Our, our yearlings gained two pounds a day in 110 degree weather in western Oklahoma. If you run them on grass, it'd be about a pound to pound and a quarter. We were given our native rest while we were utilizing the cover crops. And remember, we're accelerating the process with them. We've also got some other people that in our, in our groups that we help, Landry Howe here at Cordell, Oklahoma, he took 504 pounds of beef per acre off this test in 70 days. 
Wow. Well, what we can do. Monty Tucker at Sweetwater, Oklahoma. And folks, it never rains. Well, I'm with Derek Axton in, in here. You must live close to Sweetwater, Oklahoma because it never rains in Sweetwater. But Monty planted a cover crop on an inch and three tenths. He turned out a bunch of calves, heifers that gained two pounds a day for 32 days. And they came out of a full feed yard. So them cattle were, were flesh when they got there. Still a great gain. Monty figured them at 35 cents a pound. Look at the dollars he took on. And he only had 3.4 inches of rain for the year. Folks, I'm telling you, this works everywhere. This is our cattle that we had. We used poly tanks in the beginning. We run cows, we run cows, calves, and I jumped. This is a field day that we had last year. We demonstrated how we could move cattle with 150 people standing on the fence next to us and pull a poly wire up and put a poly wire out in 17 minutes, me and Carson. We also work in range land. It's not all about production land. This is a quarter that we bought in 2013. This is a Google Earth map. We're going to show how we improved the brush mat. That creek running north to south there was dry and had been dry for several years, but was invaded with eastern red cedar, willow, cottonwood, evasives that was getting all the water from us. So what we done, we went in there and we mechanically took them out and piled them up. We left the beneficials, the hardwoods, but we still, as you see all them black dots in the rangeland there, we still had a lot of eastern red cedar scattered. So what we done, we mechanically cut the big ones and then we burnt that. We talked about fire yesterday with Alan. There is time that fire is good. If you have evasive species that you can very cheaply, even though you burn carbon up on the top, you can straighten the system out and get a fresh start. That creek has been running water ever since then clear through our field, clear through our pasture. This is a track of land that my folks had uh, bought in the 70s. If you can look right, if I can get this to work right. Right in there is a pond. It was dry. It had been dry for several years. The springs had quit running. Ginger and I bought the property to the left. So what did we do? We went in there and once again, we took the trees out back up in here. There's springs in here. You see that over there too? Now there's a pond down below that, that pond in the property that we bought here that was dry. Now that pond is full and so is the other one. It's all about management. This is our home place. Down in the middle, you can see our neighbors haven't worked very hard in the cedar trees to the right or to the left. The Great Western Cattle Trail comes through our property. I made the oil field stay off of it, but you can see the trail right down through there. Several million head of cattle came down that trail in 1876, and that's a very good history for us. So we want to preserve as much as we can but it's about managing the system in your rangeland as well. So we do amped grazing, adaptive, multi-paddock grazing. Once again, we're measuring forage there. We're trying to improve this track of land that my son bought. So we got poly wire. We can put that out very quickly and roll that up with a drill or by hand. But we're challenged on water. A lot of these gypsum hills and stuff, cattle have to walk a long way. We built a portable water trough with a solar pump in that tank. Since we're fixing to change, that old pickup's got 400,000 miles on it, but it will start, it will run. We leave it on that pickup. We're gonna put another tank on the pickup to hook that so we have more water resources so we can go to places in the rangeland that we really need to work on where we have no water. 
We can do that very cheaply, very inefficient, I mean very efficiently. We've had great results. I also do that in cover crops. Richard Teague and I are looking at a system with no poly wire. We found if we move the water daily, the animals can train themselves to the water just like a hot wire. They are not going to travel any further than they have to if they got forage in water. Some things that we're trying. Will we be successful? I don't know, but I surrounded myself with good people and Dr. Richard Teague can help me do that. You see the cattle you see the, in the background the pickup. This is what we want. We want to trample that grass. We want to eat it. We want to try to manage that as we go through the system. We were moving daily, but we want to remember how important the bugs and the biology is. What is this? This is dung beetle. They have buried down in the soil here. We no longer use wormers that are bad for dung beetles. That is actually an egg there in the middle of a dung beetle, and this manure is below the ground. So what are they doing? My cattle are fertilizing. My dung beetles are burying it. What's the advantage of that? We have water infiltration points in the rangeland too. So when it rains, what do we got? We've got nutrients, we've got water. It's amazing. You know, the secret to getting ahead is just getting started, folks. I love this, look at this. If you're gonna stop a runaway stage, how do you do it? You can go on step one up there and jump from point A to point B to point C to point D to point F if you don't fall off and get run over, or you can just take care of it. Sometimes we carry the right answers with us, but we're not looking in the right place. We have the resources to do what we're talking about here. We started looking deeper into the soil with a proscope. We see the earthworms, we see the critters in the soil. Look at the roots of the plant growing in this wheat. You say, well, that soil's not that special, but when we go to zoom in and look at it. Look at that root down in there. Keith Burns talked about this yesterday. We've seen that root growing through an earthworm burrow. It's a Elbon rye root. We started zooming in a little bit closer with it that day. And we started to see in what we thought was water drops the first on it. But it can't be water drops because we're in the soil profile several inches. And when we talk about exudates and how the, the roots are feeding the system, now we see that. I wish, I wish I took that home and got it under a microscope. Sometimes you miss an opportunity. We look deeper. The soil is alive if you let it be. You have to look. You have to learn how to look and how important it is. When we talk about fungi and how fungi connect everything, how important is that? How important is that to nu nutrient cycling? Earthworms like this pot worm that Candy helped me identify is eating soil particles there. Look inside him and you can see the actual particles as he's eating. I was very fascinated by this. And he, he was very photogenic that day. And as you look at that, and it goes down through his system, not only is he tilling my soil, he's fertilizing it as it goes. What the system can do for us for free is amazing. Buzz Clute here, perfect example. And I quote, sometimes it's just overwhelming the life below ground. We know so much to know so little. That's so true, that's so true. We get to having fun now. This is a great project. We started putting vegetables in our cover crop for the food bank to come glean our crops. Now Ginger and I have more time to do fun things to enjoy life with meaning. 
Charles Darwin, when he saw this with Rick, called the principle with one slight variation. It's useful, it's preserved by the term of natural selection. You can plan all this together and it's going to be very successful, but it's not the strongest species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones responsive to change. And that's for us too, people. So we planted the garden all together. I got my GPS at 3020 I was talking about. I'm reliving my heritage here, enjoying it. Starts coming up. It looks pretty promising. There's, there's a cover crop and about 20 different species that's going to grow vegetables and okra and vine crops in this. But we got pollinators in there for the activity to live in. See, the, the food bank has a big problem with fresh food. They get a lot of food donated that's canned, and, from, and, and, and companies do great things for them, but it's not fresh. This is our first gleaning. They had volunteers come out to help us. Carson and Brett also helped us. One big day that we had that, that was lots of work for us, that we had three acres in this project. We filled the F-150 completely full in the back. We filled the, the four door back. We folded the seat up and we put two crates side by side and three high in there that day of everything. 2,570 pounds that we gathered that day. We're still having fun. We invited the Congressman Frank Lucas and my good friend at Lope Mike Sanders and Gary and all our partners that was in this group to come out for a media day to share our story of farmers doing the right thing, feeding ourselves and feeding the needy too. What a wonderful project we had. We invited the kids that helped come and glean at 4-H and FFA. And yeah, I went about as far as I could go that day. But what a great cause. We're still achieving our goals with cover crops. We're keeping it covered. We're enjoying life as we go. We're encouraged, we had a pilot project in Oklahoma for this. We had four of us that done it this year. We've now had six or eight more producers stepped up that we met with the food bank the other day. They're so excited. I had an elderly lady call me and she said, Mr. Emmons, I had fresh vegetables today. I'll get a little choked up here, so excuse me. She said, I haven't had fresh okra and squash in 15 years. I'm shut in, I'm in a wheelchair. Thank you. It's like, wow, wow. What we can do in a system that's alive. It didn't cost me nothing. Green Cover Seed donated the seed for the project. My local conservation district donated to drill the plant. I still achieve my goals with a cover crop and I'm helping people that really need help. Even the congressman aide came out that day with us and picked vegetables and Kirby was having a blast out there. They're not always our enemy. Sometimes you need your enemies close and make them your friends. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing wrong here. It's not rocket science, people. But what's wrong with having a little fun while you're building the system? Successful people build each other up. They motivate. Unsuccessful people just hate, blame, and complain. That's the reason I say I never go to the coffee shop. I don't want to hear it won't work because I know it works and I can prove that it works. Come to my farm, I'm not going to your area. 
I love this. Albert Einstein meets Charlie Chapman. Albert says, I, what I admire most about your art is its universality. You do not say a word, yet the world understands you. Charlie Chapman said, it's true, but your fame is even greater. The world admires you, but nobody understands you. <laughs> See, we have to make people understand us. No till on the plane's board, we struggle as we're driving to these meetings and we see all the soil eroding away and all the blowing and, and, and we feel ineffective as a board because we're not communicating and people aren't listening right. But I know by this crowd today that you are. And how you share this message is so important. It's not about Jimmy Emmons. It's about motivating you guys to share. We see that on Twitter. If I tweet something to the people that I am following and they retweet it, it, it just keeps blowing and it keeps going at a high rate of speed. That's what we can do as people out there. Never doubt that small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. It's the only thing that ever has. The revolution started with one or two people that developed into the war that structured our country differently. No till on the plane started with a concept of sharing the world and the area about how we could do better. We're starting on a new venture with Health First that gives the message out if we have healthy soul, healthy food, healthy bodies. Long live the soul. Thank you. So I had a little button challenge. And how well did Jimmy adapt to his button challenge? Uh, I really would ask you to give him another round of applause because I know how much work he put into this. <laughs> <laughs>